Hello and welcome to this deep dive conversation with me, Mitali Mukherjee. The length and breadth of India has been marked by the ravages of pollution, air, water and noise, dangerous levels of air pollution across northern India, an endless cycle of water crises in our urban communities, especially southern India. Some believe that by 2030, India will fail to meet 50% of its water demand. How did we reach breakpoint and how do we work our way out of this crisis? Joining me now to talk about that is an author and the founder of the Sundaram Climate Institute, Mridula Ramesh. Her recently released book, Watershed, addresses just these critical questions and that's what we're going to talk about today. Mridula, thank you very much for joining in first and congratulations on your book. Um, I know, having interacted with you a couple of times over the past few years, how passionate you are about the subject and uh, about everything that you've written. But, you know, as I was reading through the book, let me ask you this first. In the last five years, and I'm using a very small snapshot here, in the last five years, in terms of the escalation of the crisis with regards to water specifically, what would you say the rate of increase has been? Would you say we're 100%, you know, worse than where we were five years back? How bad has it gotten? Uh, you're asking about the water crisis. Right? Yes, specifically the water crisis. See, the thing is, it's uh, if you uh, there is a graph in the book where I look at water volatility over time, right, over the last 150 years, and you see it, it's always a variable graph. And that's something that we have to keep in mind of India's water. It varies widely over uh, years, and it has varied in the past, right? So we think this is an accelerating water crisis. But it's just water manifesting itself. It's like, you know, uh, the, the book really is about how India's relationship with its water has become dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. And as at the root of any dysfunctional relationship is the fact that you don't respect uh, the, what makes the other person or the, uh, the other person in this case being water unique, right? So the disrespect of India's facets, uh, the seasonality, the fact that it's so temporally skewed. I mean, it, uh, can you imagine that most of India's rain falls in 100 hours, right? And if we, it's something that most of us don't get. And once you understand that, you're like, well, I use water every day. But if all the rain that I'm getting is falling in 100 hours, how do I get it to stretch it out through the day? Mm -hmm. So this acceleration of a crisis, right? This acceleration of the, uh, you know, the Chennai is saying, well, which Chennai crisis are you talking about in the last six years? You know, it was the 2015 floods, then it was the 2019 drought, and now it's the rainfall. Yeah. Right? So uh, is this something that has to do with the climate? In part, because, uh, you know, the climate conversations that have been happening happen around carbon, but the climate itself speaks through water, right? And that language is becoming more menacing. But that's not the entire picture. But once you add the fact that our relationship has changed, has changed, it's become dysfunctional, and that is adding to the crisis. Uh, and the crisis is accelerating. So yes, it has gone up, you know, several fold uh, in the last few years, uh, not few years, over the 100 years, I would say it has gone up uh, several fold. But uh, the worrisome thing is it's accelerating. Yeah. Um, and there's many facets that you cover in your book. But, you know, there were three specifically that I wanted to drill down with you. One, the great Indian city water crisis. I think that's a very lived reality for many people. Mm -hmm. The second, the crisis of air and water, because I think that combination is, you know, fascinating for lack of a better word, but also deeply troubling. And the third is water and industry or water and business. So let me start with, you know, the great Indian city water crisis. And for someone who hasn't read your book yet, which is, you know, what our conversation should help with, you, you mention often the term day zero. Uh, you know, why don't you walk us through what that means and whether cities across India have encountered that and whether they've encountered it multiple times? Okay. So day zero is a politically loaded word. It was a creation in South Africa to sort of call into attention that the fact that the municipality was running out of water. But yeah. India's day zero is far more pernicious, right? South Africa hadn't exhausted its groundwater. So the kind of day zero you see in parts of Indian cities today is far more frightening because they don't have access to municipal water and they've exhausted their groundwater. 
right? So you see, um, so in my institute, we've spoken to about 2,000 households and you need that kind of number in a single city to understand how variable that experience is, right? Uh, so the experience of day zero varies by geography. If uh, So that's what I say. If you're living next to a water body, your experience is completely different from if you're living far away from a water body. If you're economically vulnerable, and, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's like the heartaching part of the story. I mean, when we find out the kind of compromises, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's really, uh, it's, it really strikes to the heart of the lived reality, how different it is if you're, um, if you're wealthy, you can buy water and water remains a small share of wallet. If you're, you know, somewhere in the middle, it's a question of uncertainty. You know, I've called for the tanker. When will it come? Will it come? That sort of thing. But if you're economically vulnerable, it's like, what else do I have to forego? Right? Uh, does the two-year-old get uh, clean water? Or do I have enough money only to ensure clean water for my six-month-old? You know, those are the kinds of things that, that's why I say, this is not a crisis. I don't know what is. Uh, and it's, it's not continuous. You know, and that's the problem with our attention span. Because it will come it'll disappear. It'll come, it'll disappear. But because it's accelerating, it's going to start coming sooner and sooner. More often, yeah. And uh, that's why more and more cities will start uh, experiencing this as more and more cities run out of groundwater, mm -hmm. simply because they draw more out than is replenished. You know, as you said, Nidula, it's, uh, it is the, the circuitous nature of this. You keep seeing the same problem popping up again and again, now with more frequency, as you pointed out, which, which makes one wonder, can we not already have highlighted which cities are the most vulnerable? And when you, you know, went through all the data that you did, which are the three or four or six or eight that popped up immediately as, as perhaps red flags that um, state governments or union governments should be looking at carefully saying, hey, there is a problem here. It's going to keep recurring. Let's see what we can do about it. So let me talk about Chennai, right? Because uh, Chennai is a city that has come too often in the news for the wrong reasons. Um, and um, it, this is a pattern that re recurs across cities, right? So let's go back to the facet of India's rainfall, which is most of India's rainfall falls in those 100 hours. And uh, demand is year round. So now, if you know, let's use a financial analogy, uh, which is more relatable to people. Suppose you get all your income in three days in a year, and your expenses are uh, year round. What do you need? You need a place to store your money, right? So that you can stretch it out. That's that's exactly what India needs, and India is so desperately short of, which is distributed storage for its waters. Ancient Indians understood it. Uh, that's one of the facets in the uh, the you know, themes in the book that in uh, ancient Indian engineering actually worked like what we call traditional technologies worked with the facets of India's water. They got it and they worked with it. So tanks can store water, um, uh, you know, uh, both local rainfall as well as rainfall coming in from out of them. And yeah. what has happened in Chennai, what has happened in Madurai, what has happened in Mumbai, what has happened in pretty much every city in India is uh, these tanks uh, earlier, and this is a chapter, this is probably one of, uh, for me, uh, the most uh, interesting chapters in the book, which is tanks used to be centers of cash flow. Yes, they stirred the water resilience, but that wasn't enough, right? Like, how do you get the com community vested in the tank? You give it a good story, right? But you also make it a good source of cash flow. So there was a source of repetitive uh, cash flow that tanks generated, you know, through fishing, through lotuses, through, uh, uh, you know, water for livestock, that sort of thing. Uh, but in cities, what, what happens to our tanks? Many of them are filled with sewage. They, they become places for landfills to be located. You know, they're not, they're not uh, uh, a placeholder for status. They can't give any perks. And they certainly don't benefit their local communities for cash flow. So what we found in, in our studies is that local communities don't care about uh, urban tank. And they never saw it as, uh, since they would forgotten the, what made their water special, they didn't understand the need for storage. So the moment that happened, uh, you know, for the local government, a centrally located tank, once it's dried, it's a great source of land. And Indian cities are starved of land, right? So Teenagar, if you go to uh, 
Tenagar in Chennai, it's this huge, busy commercial neighborhood, right? It was a tank. Not that long ago, it was a tank. It was a huge tank. It's two miles by three miles long. The rowing club held their regatta there. You know, it was a mile long course. It's yeah. gone. And so if, you, if the city floods, you ask, and you know, the tank would have replenished the groundwater. Uh, that's something we found in our studies, that uh, having a functional tank kept groundwater levels up by 200 feet. So, you know, if you fill up a tank, and then you say, well, uh, uh, I'm flooding, and well, I've run out of water in the summer. Do you blame the climate? Or do you say that, you know, you didn't understand the nature of your water, you got rid of your tanks, and what do you do now? Yeah. Um, the second part of what you write and what you referred to earlier as well, Nutala, is the deeply inequitous nature of this situation. Uh, I remember many years back, you know, hearing a talk by a professor at IIT where he explained how many buckets of water someone in Vasant Vihar, which is, you know, a posh locality in Delhi, used in one shower. And I think it was about 26 or 27 buckets versus what uh, somebody in a much lesser privileged uh, household or community might have. Uh, is this an easily resolved problem from an administrative point of view because one really struggles to understand why the situation is, is such and you see this in Delhi as well serpentine queues you know with one jerry can or one bucket and that's the water for the family and that's the water for the day. Amitali first you have to uh, we have to acknowledge that this is a problem right and we need to acknowledge you know one of the issues with this and this is something I point out in the book that during the crisis, the price paid by the poor, again, okay, I'm talking about the price paid in health, in time, in dignity, in a cash price, is far higher than the price paid in Singapore for piped water. Right? So there is a the narrative just says uh, water should be free. Uh, and it's it's a very compelling narrative and it makes it an emotional right. And once it becomes emotional, it's very difficult to talk about it. But if you look at history, uh, you know, one of the things I mentioned is Chanakya. Uh, water has always had a price. It's not been a fixed price. It's been a progressive price. So Chanakya mentions, and I, I bring that out in the book, that the, the wealthier people pay a far higher share of uh, their crops as tax than a person who is more economically vulnerable. And Water is, uh, there is not, it's a seasonal price, right? It, it varies with the fluctuations of water because it's a price paid in kind. And it's a geographically variable price. The price you would pay in a place which is water, water rich is very different from the price you would pay in uh, a place that's water poor. And very often it's paid in kind through labor or a share of crops, etc. But today we are saying, look, we can't do it, which uh, we, we can't have a price and we shouldn't measure our water. And it's become very emotional, so much so that a lot of municipalities are broke, right? And how do you get water to the last mile if you don't measure leaks, if you don't manage, if you don't, uh, if you don't manage water, right? And um, I think there was a very... There's, you know, for me, uh, one case study said, you know, a lot of uh, the economically vulnerable are paying 60 rupees for 30 rupees worth of water. And it's the, it's the thing of how to actually do the convincing. And that has to happen at the hyper-local level in the aftermath of the crisis when, you know, most of them are already paying a price and saying, look, you, you're most likely going to pay less, but let's manage it. And even if that is uh, objectionable, why don't we start with, uh, giving a direct benefit transfer, so you're kept financially whole, but this, there are, there's nobody hiding behind you, using you as an excuse for, uh, and that's what you know, a lot of the case studies uncover. The most economically vulnerable are often used as uh, something to hide behind uh, to, uh, to get a more, uh, you know, to get water demand managed. Yeah. You, um, you know, write in your book, Nidula, I'll paraphrase some of it, where you're talking about Chennai and you say the, you know, what it lived through in the period of 2018 and 2019 was an immediate cause of the fact that the rains failed in Chennai. 
and then you know you cut to three and a half years later where you know chennaiites had been cursing the skies for emptying 350 mm of rain in a single day on december 2015 and they're cursing um, the skies yeah they're cursing it today also so just a couple of weeks back and you know global uh, news watchers across the world have seen pictures of bangalore and uh, people you know sort of going by in a boat uh, you know this urban flooding phenomenon nudula of course part of it is to do with bad urban planning part of it is to do with the climate crisis but is this also also something that you think is going to start flaring with far more frequency this urban flooding of course i think you know when you the thing with uh, that climate change does right the two so i say climate change takes each of these facets of india and sort of presses on it so that's how it creates it's it's a fault line so you've got the facet right you've got take the temporal skew so you've got all your rain most of your rain falling in 100 hours yeah you don't respect that and you build over it with a tank yeah now what climate change does is it squeezes the water right so you get fewer rain days so let's say if you got your rain in 45 days now you're only going to get rain in 40 days but the rain falls in more intensive uh, episodes right uh, so extreme rainfall events then what happens you've built over your storage now when you need it more than ever and you've got uh, this uh, the climate just pressing on this fault line it's going to rupture and you're going to see this again and again and again so i think you know and that's that it has a small silver lining you have to look very hard for it but it does have a silver lining because today the tanks have become a talking point for uh, the chennai administration right so tanks have become a talking point in several cities saying okay we are now recognizing you know we finally get it we finally get why these are useful mm-hmm. and uh, let's start doing something but there is something that you know is unspoken and needs to be spoken about which is when uh, adr uh, the association in i am andabad looked at what voters prioritize yeah the lowest priority was encroachment on public lands thanks you know uh, you 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 know it's it's a politically brave thing to do yeah uh, and it's not something uh, political leaders are going to get rewarded on and i think we have to acknowledge that right yeah. and uh, if voters don't care about it in a democracy what do you do yeah i do want to talk about that you know towards the end but uh, and because i don't want to be you know dr gloom and doom is there any community city sub community mridila that is getting it right with ground water management because you know this is almost like a bad film playing over and over no, we saw our parents no, do this same, and get these a, pumps a which you know were sucking more and more water out uh, it, it's you know so everyone's doing the same thing again and again and again are there examples that exist uh, of where it's being done right or this this wrong is being corrected especially in terms of the groundwater situation no no so i think you know in groundwater uh, see i i really see my book as hopefully a book of hope on what can be done um see because i was in day zero right we ran out of our groundwater yeah and uh, uh, you know in the worst drought in madurai in 140 years you know this was the worst drought after the great famine we didn't have to buy water. and we are just water secure and it's and the fact that i would like people to take away is once you acknowledge the facets of water and you get it it's relatively easy to manage and you don't have to think about it it doesn't involve sacrifice you know like you have to change what you do but it's it's like a lifestyle change right it's once you figure it in it you can get on with the rest of your life hmm. again you know what is the hope the same thing that i've written about in my book that is you how do you rejuvenate that it has to be more than just okay let's just fix it and forget it it doesn't work it will go back to its old equilibrium how do you get the cash flow back to tanks like how do you make tanks uh, local tourism job generators right and you can do that there is one tank that i talk about which is the tepukulam in madurai where you know the, there was a article and then the courts got involved they took a tough line with encroachers and after 40 years the tank is filled with water the moment it's filled it became a very nice place for people to hang out in the evenings and soon you know from zero jobs it went to 40 jobs and then we wrote uh, our institute wrote a paper called tank tourism on what uh, what can you do 
in terms of uh, infrastructure it's not very expensive and what is the kind of jobs you can expect and uh, you know uh, some of the suggestions were uh, like boating you know put a bench for people to sit in have a selfie spot so youngsters actually like to come and hang out there things like that and then you know today uh, i think in march uh, 2021 we did a repeat survey we found there were more than 100 jobs created in that app and the good thing is the madurai corporation has rejuvenated about 19 tanks they haven't done tank tours in all of them but they've rejuvenated the tanks cleared out the encroachments etc the ground water is gone up right the, in each of these tanks the ground water has gone up around uh, surrounding communities and the icing on the cake is if you live next to a functional tank and i go through in the book on what makes a tank functional your annual your monthly spend on water is 100 rupees lower than if you live next to a dysfunctional tank mm. right so that's again cash flow yeah it's a, it's a story of hope you know you can fix this and then you know it's it just acts like magic because uh, yeah tanks are really you know you think of them as okay this is a lake what does it have to do with groundwater it's all linked yeah you've also talked about the very tenuous link between air pollution and water mridula something i think northern india is really struggling with even as we speak um are there you know clear solutions that you drew from what you saw because you've talked of course in depth about um, the farming choices and the cropping choices and the impact that has made but just taking a step forward from there what about the solutions that present themselves so here's the thing right so if you look at uh one solution is is to spread out the crop cycles and grow something else but that's going to be really really difficult to do as i think we've all found out right because once you've cramped the crop cycle uh there's this there's very little you can do and things like you know uh, the happy seeder or uh you know making pellets out of straw etc may address the air pollution but it's just it's not addressing the water problem which is the picking time water and the high level uh, state government committee uh, found that you know if uh, punjab runs out of water in uh, ground water in 20 to 25 years if the finding of that committee is is true in any shape or form what will the next generation of farmers grow and what will they grow it with uh and this farm ship is going to be probably india's defining problem in trying to shift it but i uh, what i've argued in the book is uh, trying to shift it requires different pieces working together and one is to change demand right today in the equilibrium everybody is comfortable with the equi- equilibrium except for the groundwater right which is just slowly ticking down and ticking away uh but even if you got like this very resilient uh, water efficient millet crop uh, you know farmers will ask why should i grow it and nobody is going to buy it from me and uh, nobody and the urban customer will say why are you giving me this uh, uh, millet food which is very uncool i want uh, you know the cooler food so i think we need to talk about uh, changing demand it has to happen in a decentralized fashion you know like um, if you look at the case of rajendra Uh, rajendra ji rajendra singh you know how the community slowly changed its cropping pattern right because everyone had skin in the game they'd seen a time when they'd run out of ground water you know they'd seen the absolute horrific impact it had had on their community they'd all worked to bring the rivers back and they knew what would happen if uh, they went back to the old cropping pattern and they saw multiple other benefits that came up right so boys from the village could now find girls who actually agree to marry them because you know earlier when they didn't have ground water they said when we went and asked for girls no thanks sorry, <laughs> we don't want to, no sorry we don't want to give you a uh, good girls to so you see a lot of positive multipliers in fixing it it's not going to be an easy problem to fix and what i talk about in uh, the book is two things we have to start with demand so you change the demand and then use the pool effect Yeah. um one startup that i was looking at it works with about over 3000 farmers in punjab and uh, they get fa- they work with an ngo in partnership with an ngo they getting farmers to cut down their water usage and give the farmers a sustainability tag right and that sustainability tag allows farmers to get a premium in the export market 
those farmers are saving water. They're changing their practices and saving water. So I think that's perhaps where we need to find hope. You know, these decentralized measures and you start with the map. You know, one sort of um, lingering image is, of course, the city flooding in Bangalore, Amrudullah, the kind of rains that Chennai saw. And the other was more recently for the state of Bihar, which is their most important festival, the Chhat Puja, where many of the devotees were standing in the Yamuna River and they were literally surrounded by this toxic foam. You know, it looked surreal to see many of the women standing like that. Um, industry and water, how large is it? Is it solvable? Who are the, the biggest sort of pain points over here? Uh, you've written in much detail about that. So, uh, yeah, I think, you know, I, I've put that uh, thing, right? So yeah. when I started writing about industry and water, I said, okay, which industries use water? And uh, I, there was a data point available, but the data point was very old, using data that was even older. Right. So, uh, and, you know, a friend of mine, a uh, business leader was reading this chapter and said, what about um, services? What do IT do? <laughs> you know, I think that's just lumped into city demand. And so we're dealing with a black hole, right? Yeah. And it's, it's difficult to manage a black hole. Um, what again and again that I've said is, you know, you can, you, water need not be a crisis if you understand it and manage it. But you can't manage a black hole. Um, in our factory, the, the factory that I work in um, is a textile factory. We, we make yarn. So we're not a huge user of water. We use it for worker needs and for humidification. But why we became very effective in managing water is we, used, we put 100 meters. You know? So we have very granular information of where exactly we, uh, we're using water. And that helps us understand where to intervene, how to intervene, and what is the most pain-free and effective way of intervening. And this is the message I have for industry, uh, you know, the managers and people from industry listening to this is, look, it's, it's not difficult, but you need to acknowledge it. Again, the same thing, you know, this whole dysfunctional relationship. If you, most industry leaders, when they saw groundwater as endless, when they saw water was not a problem, it's not on the income statement. It's not on the balance sheet. Yeah. So how do you manage it? What are the levers you manage it with? What are your risks? You know, you need to, you need to have, you, it needs to appear somewhere on the two financial statements that you manage. Right? It doesn't appear there. And I think slowly water is beginning to uh, g share the message that well, you have to manage it. Right? And I'm paraphrasing Bill McKeppen here, uh, but water doesn't negotiate. And I think once you start acknowledging water and you take it through to endpoint, which I've done for a couple of sectors in the book, is that uh, some sectors will uh, will change, will change uh, rapidly. Some tech sectors will be transformed. Some attitudes will have to change. Hmm. But uh, Mithali, strangely enough, this is the area that I ha see the most hope, right? Because I think investors are are getting it finally. Right? And investors and the big buyers, the big brands are saying no more because I think they're facing a lot of uh, pushback uh, from their investors and their customers. And they're saying no more and we can't do it. But unfortunately, what this, this is resulting in is a two-speed market. The larger, the more conscious brands are beginning to become more resilient, becoming uh, less polluting, but also more water resilient. The SME sector, where cutthroat competition is there and the buyers are not necessarily willing to pay for the sustainable use of water uh, is beginning to see uh, a, a crisis of existence, right? You, so one of the statistics in the book is I think a $10 t-shirt from uh, 1991 costs about $9 change today. You know, there's not a lot of sustainability you can do with that. And you see pushback from buyers even today. Like, you know, we want sustainability, but cost is most important. Yeah. And in the SME sector, that's going to be difficult to manage. And I think you know this is where my message is to consumers. Again and again, it comes back to demand. If you demand and you say, look, I want to know how my garment was made. I want to know how my book was made. I want to know how my paint was made. I want to know everything. And I'm willing to pay... Not much. We're talking two rupees per t-shirt, right? Two to three rupees more per t-shirt. Um, 
and make sure that goes back to the maker. And I think uh, we've got this problem solved. It's getting solved in part. Which also demands a fairly evolved consumer though, Mridula. You know, on the policy side, what have you seen happening over the last, I don't know, five or ten years? I mean, has this problem been addressed? Is it, uh, are they cognizant of it? Are there solutions, global solutions that present themselves to how this so can the, do it? So, yeah, I mean, like a lot of companies are saying we're going to go water positive. You see, the, that's the other, that's one of the reasons I wrote this book, right? Like a lot of people are saying we're going to go net zero by 2030. So they're talking about carbon. They're getting carbon because carbon is what uh, features is the lead uh, player in the climate conversations. But people don't recognize enough that the climate itself speaks through water, right? And they need to mainstream water in the climate conversations. And the moment you get that, it's a solvable problem, right? You're talking paying two to three rupees more per t-shirt. That's not, it's not a huge amount. And if you can just say, look, this is the message that needs to happen. I think it's going to happen in carbon because I think investors are telling big brands, you need to do this. And brands are saying, okay, we will do this. And, you know, you're, it's going to move down the supply chain and they're finding ways and means to track it. And it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. In water, the communication is a little more dense. That's, that's part of the reason why the book was written. Which takes me back to, our, you know, the previous thing we were talking about, um, Ridula, about what a voter or the citizenry wants. Uh, At what point do you think this will become a political ask? You know, the fact that I want clean air and this is something that I demand from a political party that is asking for my vote. Or the fact that, you know, it's not so much, I mean, some parties are offering free water, but what about the supply of water and the quantum of water? I want it to be easily accessible. Do you see this uh, in the future becoming a, a point on which and individual votes? So, okay, there are two things that you've mentioned there, and the two things are very separate, right? Uh, what they want and what they will vote on. Those are two different things, okay? And the problem is when we conflate the two, we think the two are the same, they're different. So in most water surveys, and I've gone into this in the book, drinking water becomes very important, mm-hmm. right? They want drinking water. That's a high, uh, that's a high priority governance item for voters. Uh, will they vote on it is a more interesting question. So uh, I didn't know the answer. So we, in our institute, we went and asked this question, right? Why you take a guess when you can go and ask? Um, so we asked this question to over 900 people. And we asked this during the water crisis. So when 2019 Chennai water crisis was going on, there was also 2019 Tamil Nadu water crisis like you know, uh, going on. So there were people in our survey who were getting water once in four days, once a week, you know, this is the middle of the night. It was, water was a pain. So in the middle of the survey, we asked the question, could you vote on water? 600 people gave us an answer. And the short answer was no. They would not vote on it. A small percentage. So when we, when we dice the answers by people who got water daily, uh, about 8% said they would vote on water, but they would vote on the things that uh, you mentioned. Will I get a connection? Will I get a sewerage connection? That sort of thing. People who got water once in four days, once a week, you know, people who didn't get water, they said, yes, we would vote on water. 16% said they would. So, but it's still, these are not big numbers. Yeah. Right? Only one person, one gentleman said, I will give my vote for the person who desilts the canals. Yeah, I think this is a, a whole other separate conversation, but so, it's certainly... No, but yeah. it's, the, it's the conversation India needs to Yeah, have. it is. It, it, it is uh, because you're putting the cart in front of the horse by saying political leaders don't get it. And that's the point of the book. Political leaders get it. They just don't know how to win with it. Yeah. So I think it's the, the empowering message in this for me is it comes back to communities. It comes back to decentralized action and that's the most effective stage to deal with water because water is so variable what works in my neighborhood won't work you know two kilometers from here it Correct. needs different interventions and uh, it is a depressing message but it's the most empowering also because i can do something about it yeah, yeah. that's yeah. something i've seen time and time and time and time again and when you say water is my responsibility uh you end up doing something quite effective about it, which is what the stories in the book tell you. 
So let me close with you know uh, this this question to you then because I know that um, you've done incredibly interesting things in your own living space in terms of conserving water and saving water and using it judiciously. For somebody watching, what's the four or five things I can be mindful of within my own living space? I can't change what's happening in the city. Maybe I can't get that tank in, uh, you know, for my living community. But what can I do as an individual, as a family, to to do something differently and more mindfully? Acknowledge water. First thing, acknowledge it. Don't take it for granted. Same thing. Dysfunctional relationships tend to share facets. Uh, acknowledge water. Acknowledge its uh, specialness, which we've forgotten about. Uh, I think that's the starting point. Right. The second point is. Uh, measurement. It. Uh, I mean, uh, I, th- I know one of my editors said, "Why do you have so much, so many meters in your house and factory?" I said, "You know, apart from my OCD personality, <laughs> so, you, know, you, you can get granular, and it helps you intervene, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, intervene better. But a single, like you know, you're seeing uh, startups come up which uh, give you all these meters with bells and whistles, and I've gone through that in the book." And I think the more you measure, the easier it is to manage. Um, but just be conscious of it, you know, like uh, uh, what are your big points of usage? The second, the most important thing in our life, uh, in our becoming resilient, was actually reusing water, right? Understanding that all uses don't need the same quality of water and different uses can do with different qualities. So we actually have several qualities of water running the house and it's, it sounds more complicated than it is. A local neighborhood plumber would be able to help you with it. And uh, many apartments are going in for using one quality of water for flushing, one quality of water for drinking, and uh, reusing, you know, treating their sewage and reusing it within, uh, reusing at least part of it within their communities. And that adds to your resilience like nothing else, right? And I think. So these are the three things I would say. Just be mindful of it. First, acknowledge it. Right? Yeah. Acknowledge that A, it is water is what it is. India's water is what it is. It's your responsibility. right? It's very comforting, very comforting to blame someone else. But at the end of the day, it's your water. You have to manage it. That's the, that's the you know, you can't get away from yeah. this. The second thing is measure. Uh, because you can't manage what you don't measure. You can't manage a black hole. Uh, or if you try to manage a black hole, you won't, may not get where you want to go. And thirdly, I think, uh, you know, reuse, which is uh, like sewage, I call the Brahmastra in our back, back pocket. You know, it really is. It brings you independence. Yeah. Always fantastic speaking with you, Mridula. All the very best with your book. Uh, you. Keep the good fight going. <laughs> You've been talking about this and doing so much fantastic work around it. So it's really uh, inspiring to see all the great work you've achieved so far. All the very best. Thank you. Get a sneak peek of exclusive content before everyone else for channel members only. Memberships start at Rs 89. Hit the join button below.